this is the count. This is the second of three county jails that we had in Derby. Uh, we had five prisons, five jails in Derby at one time or another. We're a bad lot, to say the least. Uh, the first jail was created in 1580 odd, uh, a foul, stinking place uh, where the uh, Mark Eaton Brook flowed by, which was also the town sewer, and it used to flow in through the prison windows. Uh, Terrible place. Uh, in 1756, they built a new one, which is this. Um, that's it up there on the left-hand side. Up there, you're actually down below. Would you? Be? I know it looks as if you're coming ground level, but when we go up to the other jail in a, in a bit, you actually go up the steps. So we're actually in the cellars of what's above, although it's ground level, but it ain't ground level from the front. We're underneath where those people are on the horses. Uh, under, underground, and yet we're not, but we are. Um, it was, uh, you're only in a tiny bit. It's three times as long as what you're in now. It goes through next door and through next door but one still. And the cells are still there. Um, but I can't have them. Because they belong to a firm of solicitors called Swindle and Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> Does it not say it all, guys? Yeah. Hey, the burglars. Any, anybody from the legal profession here with us tonight? No. Burglars in suits, basically, is what I call them. Uh, and then, they, do they store the, all they do is store the documents down below in the cells. I mean, it's just sacred. That's Derby. A anybody from Derby? No. No? No. Well, yeah. you're not missing much. Trust me, I am. Uh, we're brain dead. We're absolutely yeah. right. Could, I mean, this could be a major <laughs> tourist attraction <laughs> if, if you had the whole damn thing. But no. Anyway, um, when it opened in 1756, it wasn't opened, it wasn't a prison, it was a jail. Mm -hmm. And the difference was in those days, you were only imprisoned until the trial. So if you, and there were four trials a year, spring, summer, autumn and winter, the assizes. And Derby was the assize town, Nottingham was the assize town, Stafford was the assize town, Leicester was the assize town. And it was a travelling judge, just like on cowboy films. So in other words, one week he'd be in Warwick, the next week he'd be in Stratford, the next week he'd be in Birmingham, and then he'd be in Nottingham, and then he'd come to Derby. Uh, spring, summer, autumn and winter. So if you missed the spring assizes, you, had to, you were imprisoned until the summer assizes, three months later. And so it was a place to hold you until trial. Once the trial took place and you were found guilty, as most people were, because number one, you had to conduct your own defence. Number two, you were probably an illiterate person that couldn't read or write. Uh, and the guy that had uh, accused you of, right, prime example, right? We, we don't have anybody from Derby apart from me, so. Uh, and if somebody's from Nottingham, get Nottingham, yes. careful how I say this. Uh, so here's me, a poor, illiterate, working person with 12 kids, wife's pregnant, 13th kid on the way. Um, for the last three days I've wandered down this lane and I've stopped and each day I've stood looking over the gate, ogling at the farmer's sheep. I'll <laughs> be counting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say no more. Yeah. <laughs> On the fourth day, one of the farmer's sheep disappeared. Well, it was me, wasn't it? Of course it was. Well, I, I, I didn't do it on there. It wasn't me at all. Yes, I, I'll be honest with you. I did. You know, I do like sheep. <laughs> and I did look at them because they really were fine animals. But I didn't pinch one. Well, he's one of the landowners, he knows he's in the same club as the judge, he drinks in the same tavern as the pro prosecution people, and I'm brought here, locked away till the assizes. Um, I conduct my own defence, and who's, who are they going to find guilty? Me, aren't they? There's no appeal, and I'm usually hanged within two days of the sentence of death being passed upon me. And we are talking of 222 hanging offences in this country from 1723. It was called the Bloody Code or the Black Act. So stealing a sheep, stealing a cow, stealing a horse, shop breaking, house breaking, burglary, murder, attempted murder, rape, attempted rape, setting fire to a haystack. Four men hanged in front of this building in 1817 for setting fire to a haystack at South Wingfield in Derbyshire. Uh, in the same year, three men hanged and beheaded in front of this building. Um, Admittedly, one of them was from Nottingham. 
um, <laughs> Jeremiah Brandreth, the Nottingham captain, as he was called, the last beheading in Great Britain in front of this building in 1817. Um, so it was rather an unfair situation. Right, now, so you're brought to court, and every offence wasn't a hanging offence, not quite, but nearly. So you, would, you wouldn't be put in prison, the judge wouldn't sentence sentence you to prison. He would sentence you to be whipped at the cart's tail till your back be bloody. So they stripped you to the waist, tied you to the back of a horse and cart, and took you through the streets of Derby with the jailer whipping you with a cat of nine tails, which was a, a whip with nine thongs and all of them knotted to make it even more painful. If you were alive when you got back, took you back to your cell and rubbed salt into the wounds to... to yeah. Um, or you would be branded with a red-hot branding iron on the side of your cheek with a letter T for thief. It's an early form of CRV check, that is. <laughs> Think about it. Walking into a jeweler's shop with a big T on your face. Out. Yeah, yeah come on. Um, he hasn't got a T on his face, has he? What? Hey. <laughs> 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 oh, he went on. Oh, right. Oh, I see. OK, right, OK. Um, or <coughs> transportation. Um, to originally America, and then we lost America, so it was Australia, uh, or hanging. And they say 222 hanging offences. The whole idea was to eliminate the criminal element for this country. And the best way to do that was to kill them. And so you can't imagine um, the, 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 the torment um, of the people here spending their last night in the condemned cell. The, the guy, right, that, I mean, not only are you condemning the poacher to death, but you're also condemning his children to death. Because his wife, you know, if he, is, if he has got a wife that's got 12 kids and, and pregnant, how's she going to go out and work? How can she poach and pinch a few rabbits and feed the kids? He's the, he's the breadwinner. So once he's been hanged, or transported for that matter, the kids are left behind. They're going to die as well. Is the most unfair system that you could ever imagine. Um, and these people knew this in the condemned cell the night before their execution. They knew that they were going to, well, that their kids were going to probably die as well. Um, so, um, all these crimes, the only thing you could be in prison for was debt. And you weren't allowed out of prisons until you paid your debts. Why are you going to pay your debts, isn't it? You could work. The room you're in here, you're in a prison cell, guys, here. There should be a wall here. This, this was a very seedy nightclub for many, many years. Uh, and they were allowed to knock it about. And as you can see, the, this, this is a wall. This shouldn't be open. There's the door, prison cell door. And this should be closed off. But I've, I've left this like this so I can get more of you in. Otherwise, you know, you'd be sat in there and you wouldn't be able to do what I was saying. What's that glass behind the table, please? Uh, so, um, where was I? So, yeah, basically, you'd... you'd um, you come into this, this is a bigger room as you can see, it's got a fire and it's also got a big window and you'd come in here and work. <laughs> they'd let, you, they'd let, let you out yourself. So if you were in Taylor, yeah, this, <laughs> hey, hang on, this is, this is weird. Something going on tonight. Tell you. Um, they'd let you out of your cell during the daytime and you'd come in here, if you were a tailor, or a shoemaker or whatever, then you'd bring your needle and cotton and stuff and you'd work. And you'd repair clothes for the prisoners or make new stuff. Uh, and if they got any money, they'd, they'd pay you. And if you could pay, get enough money, you could pay off your debts and then they'd let you out. But not <coughs> until you'd paid the jailer, because basically this was run as a franchise. Um, he hired the jailer, who's the man in charge, hired the jail from the council and he paid a rent for it, and he charged the prisoners for everything. If you wanted extra straw in your mattress, you paid for it. If you wanted a candle in your prison cell, you had to pay for it. And if you were being released from prison, you had to pay the jailer to pay the blacksmith to knock your chains off. So the whole thing was, 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 was a, was a rip-off, basically. You were absolutely... Uh, the chances of people coming out of here were yeah. very remote, alive. Uh, numerous debtors would have committed suicide, killed themselves in here. Um, other people hanged themselves, which I'll tell you about. A couple of brothers that hanged themselves above, from the wood, wood above the door of the cell, the condemned cell. 
Um, so it was a place of terror, torment, pain, anguish and death. Um, when it opened in 1756, there was no segregation. So old and young, male or female, <coughs> tried or untried, sane or insane, would be put in the same cells together. I don't even imagine what, what, what went on in, in these cells. Um, it's unbelievable. No wonder it's haunted. Simple as that. <coughs> um, so it's a place of, you know, death, basically. Um, hangings beyond belief taking place in front of the building um, from 1812 when they created what was called the New Drop, which was a trapdoor and a lever where people were hanged, hanged, but, but sorry, executed rather than hanged is what they referred to. Because once they had the, the trapdoor and the lever, the idea was to broken neck. Before that, you died of slow strangulation, taking anything up to a quarter of an hour to die at the end of a rope, dancing, kicking, writhing, choking, vomiting, urinating, stop, they've not had the jacket potatoes yet, <laughs> uh, at the end of a rope. And the more convulsed you were, the more you kicked and danced at the end of the rope, the more the crowd loved it, because everyone came to watch. Because all executions in this country till 1868 were public. Come here. I presume that was someone in here. I hope. Yeah? I saw it. Oh, <laughs> oh that's all right. That was very... I thought it was a tiny... That was quite... When I say, when I say tinny, I, didn't, I don't mean your phone. But it sounded like someone tapping on a... a, a, on a that's a, exactly what it is, just a knock. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow. like it. Going a hearty place. Well, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Oh. it? Um, <laughs> I want to. <laughs> so all, all the ingredients in here add up to creating hauntings, that's the thing. Prisons, jails are very haunted because of the amount of torment and death that, that, that went on. Um, I'm actually, at the moment, just, just working on... Um, I'm not going to hurry, are they, Peter? I don't no, know. no, no, that's all right. I'm actually working on a, because I do a TV programme called um, Forbidden History, um, which is quite interesting, so the stuff's very different, it's all stuff that um, most histor history programmes don't, don't talk about, which is quite something. Um, but I'm now working on something about executions, because I do an executions day on the, the, the last, uh, last Saturday of the month, where we take nominations for... Mums and dads, brothers and sisters, <laughs> and children. <laughs> you know, bring them Why along and we'll, we'll drinking, chop, yeah? chop their heads off here. Um, Gina wants yeah, exactly. Uh, She's already been. Um, and, uh, and I'm working on this programme, and it's rather, I'm sort of digressing slightly, but it, it is actually, it is to do with what, what I'm talking about here. Um, and I was going to call it The Hangs, I was going to do this programme all about executions and executioners, the fascinating stories about it. And I was going to call it the Hangsman, because they, they originally weren't called the Hangman, they were called the Hangsman. Because see, everyone says everyone was hung. There's no such word as hung, it's hanged. And so people were not hung, drawn and quartered, they were hanged, drawn and quartered. And the judge said, and you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And the bloke that did it was referred to as the Hangsman. Not the Hangman, the Hangsman, originally. I thought, oh, good title for that. But anyway, the producer says to me, uh, he says, it's not, uh, it's not juicy enough. It's not, people will think it's just about hanging. But what they don't realise, of course, is the hangman, the hangsman, did everything. <coughs> when he wasn't hanging people, he was whipping at the calf's tail. When he wasn't whipping at the calf's tail, he was branding them. When he wasn't branding them, he was beheading them. When he wasn't beheading them, he was hanging, drawing and quartering them. And in Germany and France and places like that, he would also be cutting off the heads with a sword, breaking them on the wheel, which is smashing them to pieces when they're strapped, spread eagled onto a wheel, all of this stuff. So the hangman did everything. But as they said to me, that's all very well, but that doesn't say that in the title. It doesn't say that on the tin. You know, the hangman. Mm, the hangman. So I've had to come up with a new title. And what I've just been saying to you is, is, is because basically all of this stuff that went on to these, for these poor, poor, poor people, imprisoned in here, was torture. 
But torture was illegal in Britain. Wrong. Torture was illegal in England. And it's got some us. <laughs> yeah, it's all right, you can insult me, I'm okay. Good. As you probably know only too well, the Scots are very pro European and think of themselves as a European country. And probably one of the reasons was that Mary, Queen of Scots, was Queen of Scotland and Queen of France, and the, the world believed Queen of England as well, because her cousin. Um, no, I am digressing. Her cousin, and uh, America, uh, it, well, 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 Queen Elizabeth, was illegitimate because she was the daughter of Henry VIII's second wife. So, in the Catholic world's eyes, Mary Queen of Scots was also Queen of England, and there was a thing. And her, Mary Queen of Scots' mum, who was regent of Scotland, was a lady called Marie de Guise. She was French. So, the, 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 it's called the old alliance between Scotland and France, and ever since then. There's been a, a big alliance between France and Scotland, and, and Scotland has always considered itself very re European. Now, the Europeans tortured people. So did the Scots. Still do. <laughs> it's, it's fact. So breaking on the wheel, as one or two of you saw flinch, it's the most dreadful form of execution anybody could imagine, um, was done in Europe, but the Scots did it as well. We didn't. We were nice people. The English were very nice. We didn't torture people. But when I say we didn't torture people, all of this execution isn't only, isn't only execution, but it's torture. Because there is not, and I've looked into it in depth, there is not, there is no form of execution that is instantaneous. There is no form of execution that doesn't not cause a lot of pain. And a lot of it we've devised on purpose to torture and make people suffer. And the reason we've done it is because basically it's re revenge. An eye for an eye and all that sort of stuff. And so all these form of executions that I'm talking about, hanging, hanging, drawing and quartering, beheading, guillotining, breaking on the wheel, burning at the stake, garrotting, drowning, boiling, these are all things that we did. They all contain a, quite a considerable amount of not only mental torture beforehand but also physical torture as you're dying even lethal injection I, I can't believe it I thought that lethal injection was when I had my cat put to sleep a fortnight ago you know and they just gave him a little injection and he just closed his eyes and went to sleep that does not happen in America when they're giving him a lethal injection it sometimes takes for an hour and a quarter while they're fighting to try and find a vein to put the lethal injection in in the first place and then they do it because the medical profession won't do it. So they have a technician in the prison. That, and they get the drugs wrong, they get the dosage. Oh, guys, you wouldn't believe that. It, it's all torture. So I've come up with this idea now uh, that the programme's going to be called Execution, Butchery and Torture. <laughs> or, or Execution or Butchery or Torture. But no, I think Execution, Butchery and Torture because that's what it is. It really is. We have devised the most dreadful forms of death in the name of the law. And these poor sons here you know, knew what was going to happen to them. And, and, you know, for instance, you know, we hanged, drew and quartered three Catholic priests in, in, in some, on St Mary's Bridge here in Derby in 1588. And, and a, a good executioner could get you disemboweled while you're still alive and conscious. And then burn your 37 feet of small intestine, which they'd ripped out of your stomach, before your eyes, while you're still alive. I mean, you know, w why? Because it was all tra it was treason. The most treacherous thing you could do was to, to do something against the king or the government. And so they had to do all these terrible things to you to make you suffer. So no one else would do it. And it isn't, it, hanging was not a deterrent. Execution is not a deterrent. It doesn't stop murder. It really doesn't. It's amazing. People still do it. I, I still personally am a believer in, in capital punishment, but only for certain things. And that's the murder of children, the murder of a policeman, or the armed forces for that matter, terrorism, and premeditated murder. You bought the gun, you loaded it with five bullets, and you've pulled the trigger five times, and you then reloaded it. In other words, you know, if you came home and you found a missus in bed with someone else and you picked up a baseball bat and smacked him on the head, 
then that's different. <laughs> yes, I think so. Because you lost your egg, you, you, you flipped. You, it wasn't premeditated murder. Yeah, you killed them, but you didn't re you, yeah, you did mean to at that moment, but well, that's me, that's just me. But anyway, what form of execution do you devise? I don't know. There isn't one. So these poor people here um, that have suffered terribly, you know, it's one of, one of the reasons that they're still here. Uh, because of the... You see, I'm a great believer that, that it's the, a lot of the nature of the form of death causes a haunting. Um, lots of different... And so here, we've, we, the, the vast majority of what we've got, I believe, haunting this place are tormented souls that don't move on. Because they're terrified of, of what the government did. Because basically, right, so you, I said to you, you could be hanged for stealing a sheep. You could ha be hanged for stealing a few rabbits from Lord so-and-so's estate. But you could also be hanged for murder. And a guy um, in 1816 hacked his niece and nephew to death with a gorse hook in Hullam Ward near Ashbourne. The little boy was four and he, he, hacked, he chopped his head off. And the little girl was eight and he hacked the two of them to pieces with a gorse hook. And it was his, it was his niece and nephew. Now, I think he deserved to hang, personally. But the bloke that stole a few rabbits to feed the 12 kids, oh, come on. Yeah, oh yeah, hang him as well. Same death, same, exactly the same. Well, I think it's wrong. So in 1752, the church and the state came together to make the punishment for the crime. And they passed the Murder Act of 1752 which stated that, right, we're into ghosts and everything else, and I'm sure some of you heard this before, there's this very important phrase called laid to rest, which meant so much then. do not mean so much now. And we were not, you know, laid to rest today, I mean, it doesn't really, you know, I mean, most people are cremated now and your, and your ashes are scattered or you can, you know, scatter them at Anfield or, where, you know, wherever you, wherever you want, wherever your favourite place is, take it down to the seaside, Take it back to Skeggy and scatter your ashes on the beach, or, or you know what I mean. It doesn't matter. But in the in the days when most ghosts are from, people expected a decent burial, and it had to be a, a burial. It couldn't be burning, and I'll explain why it couldn't be burning in a minute. But basically, you had to have six foot of earth, a gravestone with your name on it, the family round the grave, and a Christian burial service to lay you to rest. Now, if, you, if you're not at rest, where are you? You're abroad, you're a, you're a tormented soul, wander, you're a ghost, for want of a better word. So the, the, the church and the government said, right, let's pass them out, let's make the punishment fit the crime. And they said, right, no murderer is allowed to be buried. A poacher can be buried, a burglar, a rapist, uh, a forger, a, a, any, anything you like. Oh, yeah, they can all be buried. And family can have you back after you've been... After you've been um, uh, hanged, tortured, and killed slowly, but they can have your body back, and they can give you a decent burial, which of course will satisfy you. It'll lay you to rest. But the murderer, oh, no, 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 we're not going to murder, no, no. So we're not going to bury him. Uh, so what we're going to do with him? Well, when the judge passed sentence of death on the murderer, he said, you'll be hanged by the neck until you are dead, and then publicly dissected in the Shire Hall, in St Mary's Gate, in Nottingham, in Stafford, in Leicester, wherever it happened to be. Uh, and that meant that after you were dead, you were taken back to the Shire Hall, laid on a table, and publicly dissected. In the same way as we do at school with goat, goats, with, with, <laughs> with, with uh, I, don't, I don't know anybody that's ever dissected a goat, to be honest with you. Uh, with, with um, frogs and, and and rats and yep, uh, you know, checking out, having a look at the heart and blah, blah. and they took you back, laid you on a table, which is that picture up there in the middle of the fireplace there, uh, laid you on a table and took everything out, wired up your, uh, took your skeleton to bits, boiled it in a cauldron to get the meat off it, look, and there's the dog eating some of the meat on the floor, look, oh my God, yeah. uh, that is an original Hogarth print from 1753, that is, uh, of, of a public dissection. Um, your skin was flayed, 
removed, taken off and tanned in the local tan yard in St. Full Street in Derby and used to bind books telling of your life and trial or if there's a big enough piece of pair of slippers for the man out of your skin as a souvenir. Right? Uh, now the punchline of this story is the body wasn't whole. And that meant to any good Christian in those days if the body wasn't whole on burial then there's no physical resurrection for you on the day of judgment. And where are you going to go? Straight to hell. And burn in hell for eternity. At 10,000, hotter than my fire, I tell you. 10,000 <laughs> degrees centigrade with gnashing of teeth and ripping off flesh and all the terrors of Dante's. These guys sat in the condemned cell believed all this. They weren't only condemning him to death. Death wasn't the problem. Death was commonplace. Well, most people were dead by 40. Kids predeceased them, they'd been in battles, they'd seen executions. It was the afterlife that meant everything. The terror, God fearing people. Why should we fear God? Oh, yes, we have to be God fearing. We're all born sinners, you know, and we have to, the whole of our life has to be spent, apparently, um, atoning for our sins. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anyway, you can probably tell I'm not, I'm not the most religious person you'll ever meet. Um, I believe in something. I believe there's a creator, some sort. Call it God if you will. Call it Jehovah or Allah or Muhammad or... I don't know. You know why, why is he a man, by the way? Why is he a man? Yeah. Anyway, it's another story. Yeah, absolutely. No, tosh. Sorry if I upset him with <laughs> but um, no, I don't think. So anyway, so the situation is that um, the body wasn't whole, and so the soul and spirit of that person, of the murderer, isn't only condemned to death, but condemned to hell. And so, as I've said so often, well, you know, St Peter's not let it, going to let you through. I'm certainly not going down there. I'll stop here, thanks. It's caused ghosts. It's caused people to stay behind because they are, and that was the desired effect. That was the whole idea to create tormented souls that to punish them beyond death by not going to hell, by not by not going to heaven, expecting them to go to hell, but some of them haven't gone to hell because they stayed behind. Because apparently God gave free the will. You can go where you want, do what you want, and so stop here, thanks. And that's why places like this have got so many ghosts in them because there's so many people that are still here that are terrified of divine retribution and hellfire and damnation and the, t the things that they you know that they they believed in in those days see the average amount of information that a working person took in in the 1600s in their lifetime we take in in one week why is that well there was nothing you know i mean but no newspapers, no Facebook, no Instagram, no Twitter, no radio, no TV, no cars, no bikes, no buses, no trains, no nothing. The people in the village never left the village. They intermarried, married their cousins and what have you, and, and never moved out of the village. They never heard of, they didn't get any information like we get today. So the most important single thing to the working person was the creation of children the preservation of those children by going out to work and feeding them, and their faith, their religion. Whether they went up or whether they went down was absolute paramount to them. And it meant so much to people that it's caused ghosts. The church is responsible. The church, the church has done it. The church is responsible for creating, not all ghosts, a lot of ghosts. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I'm, I'm a huge believer in, you know, sort of... Play. See, battlefields and things like that, they, they are... God, they are so underestimated for um, the amount of hauntings that are there. Because, you see, the only people that ever went on the battlefield in the olden days was, was the soldiers at the time. But after that, the only people who went on the battlefield was the farmer. And probably if one or two people go take the dog for a walk. Or the occasional person that pulled up on the lay-by and went for a picnic. 
And then all of a sudden, reenactment came on the scene in the in the oh Christ, fifty years ago from America. And all of these tormented souls that are still wandering the battlefields, all these soldiers, young soldiers. You see, it's got all the ingredients to create hauntings on a battlefield. It's got murder. It's got suicide. It's got execution. It's got not being laid to rest. No closure. Young soldiers crawling away, severely wounded. Lying in a ditch, calling for the mum. As all soldiers do. For some they don't call for the wife or, or the kids. or they, they, they call for the mum as they're dying. And nobody ever found the body. So there's no closure for them. No laid to rest. The body, the skeleton or whatever, is still lying in the ditch. Um, all the ingredients to create hauntings. Um, and then reenactment came on the scene in the same way as trigger objects. You know, if there's a child in a bedroom, and we, we take, so we take a teddy bear and put it in the bedroom in the, in the hope that it might attract the ghost of the child back. Well, there you've got this young, I don't know, 15-year-old drummer boy that was blown to pieces on the battlefield and his spirit's still there and he's wandered the battlefield ever since waiting for his regiment because he still thinks the war's on or something and all of a sudden this is a group of red-coated soldiers coming towards him oh, the bag it's my mates my platoon my regiment no it's not it's a group of reenactors that are marching up and down the battlefield they, be they become trigger objects for ghosts on battlefields the number of reenactors on battlefields that now see ghosts. Unbelievable. Um, so, um, have I dealt with, oh, there's tons more, tons more, of course, but I mean, I'll, I'll just, yeah, in, uh, just a little bit of, a bit of proof about this business, because you see, this is what this place is about. It really is. This was a place of torture, even though it was illegal, but you know, mental and physical pain and torture in a place like this, um, that's, that's, Definitely, definitely cause ghosts. There's no doubt about it. But, um, where was I? I've lost it now. Because I don't do scripts, by the way. Um, <laughs> I just open my gob and it normally pours out. <laughs> it's called verbal diarrhea, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, so they're still around. And a lot of them need help. They need to go. They shouldn't be here. You realise that? You see, one of the things about this ghost business, for me, is that it's a bit like going to the zoo. You're here tonight <laughs> to see a ghost. But that poor ghost that's still here was once a human being, like you and me, that is, that shouldn't be here. That's the big one. It shouldn't be here. It should have gone. But for God's sake, don't ask me where. Because I can't tell you. Heaven? Doubt it. Hell? Even less likely, this dimension, this frequency, this, this time zone, this, this spiritual plane, this spiritual level, somewhere, because they go somewhere. There's no doubt about it. Where they go, I don't know. But those that are here, are here for a reason. And the reason that most of them are here is because they're too frightened to move on. So that means that they're stuck here. That means that, you know, it's time. It's a bit like the zoo. It's a bit like sort of going and looking at the chimpanzees. <laughs> oh, it's, we need to get there about five o'clock because it's feeding time. <laughs> you know, you know, we need to see the chimpanzees being fed. Oh, look at the little... Poor buggers are stuck in behind a cage. for the... It's a bit like ghosts. They're actually stuck here. And we've come to see them. Hopefully, God, come on. I mean, the ghosts tonight. I'm going to hear one or sense one or smell one. Yeah, and, and perhaps we shouldn't be. Or perhaps we should, I don't know. But perhaps we should be actually um, helping them on the way. How should, and, and all this came from, from I, I did a, because um, I've done, I don't know, 37 DVDs on various counties of Great Britain, on sale outside there. Only nine ninety nine signed copies of that. <laughs> Hopefully I've got a York one. Um, Great club. Uh, and, yeah, and, um, I, I, I was doing court, Ghosts of Cornwall, and I was staying in this place um, <coughs> opposite St Michael's Mound, in a hotel with a lady, the landlady, it was called Orange. 
What a strange person. What a strange name. She wasn't orange. Her name was Orange. And she was a bit spiritual, to say the least. And she went, she got about 13 ghosts in this hotel. And she was telling me about this lady that's cleared them all. And she vacuums up ghosts. She's not a ghostbuster. Well, she ain't got a real vacuum. And I said, really, this sounds... She said, oh, no, she's really... She's a, she's a, a spiritualist medium. And, blah, blah, blah. and she actually vacuums them up and sends them on the way. And I said, wow. That sounds a bit... Would she be prepared to talk to me? She said, well, I don't know. And it depends on how real she thinks you are. Or whether you're just in this for, you know, sort of finance and what, which, which is this is my profession so yeah I am but anyway she fixed up a meeting with me and this lady kept oh super quite large very blonde well well into her 70s um, and we sat down and we did this interview which is on Ghost of Cornwall only 9.99 sign <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had this fascinating conversation with her and she was the one that actually told me about she was the one that alerted me to the fact of the church and what it had done. And how, you know, people can stay behind because they're terrified of the teaching of the church and, and, and Judgment Day and the body not being whole and blah, 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 blah. And, and she said, well, I, I, she said I, 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 I can't speak to them. They can only speak to me. I, I, she said, I can't dial them up. They can only dial me. I'm the, I'm the telephone exchange, she said. I'm there as a... As a a receiver, and if there's, there's a spirit there, it can come through me. I can't, so in other words, Fred can't come up and say, can you get me dad? Can you dial me dad up? I want to have a word with him. No, she can't do it, she says, you can't do that. They have to come through you. And if you're in a place where they're there, that's how they'll sometimes come through. And she, she goes around places in Cornwall, she's very unpopular in Cornwall, because she goes to stately homes and castles and stuff like that, and goes in, so she says, and, and there they are, and she says, uh, uh, why are you here, love? What, what, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I did this, I, I committed a crime, or I murdered someone, I did this, and, and I daren't move on, and she, she actually tells them to go, to go to the light, and that there'll be um, a door open up there, and there'll be people waiting, because their loved, their loved ones are waiting for them, they don't have to be here. And she vacuums them up and sends them on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, this is... She said, I am so unpopular. So I did it at Pengersit Castle in Cornwall, which we did our most orders. And she said, they banned me from ever coming back again. Because <laughs> they reckoned that I got rid of the ghosts in Pengersit <laughs> Castle. And I'm thinking, wow. But I really like what she said. I, I found it a very different take to it. And, and she actually said to me, so, right, so, so you're driving down the M1, <coughs> and, and, and you know you, you know how we, she says we slow up when there's an accident and things like that. We look, yeah, I said, yeah. But you're driving down the M1, and you see a child that's been hit by a car and is lying on the um, hard shoulder. What would you do? Would you say, oh, no, 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 look at that kid there, lying there, bleeding to death. Or would you stop and help? I said, well, you'd stop now, wouldn't you? She said, well, why don't we do that with spirits then? That are crying out for help in the same way. And I'm thinking, you know, you know, yeah, because the, because guys, they were human beings. They're, they're not aliens. Ghosts are not alien. Ghosts are, ghosts were human beings. They were you and me. One, one, one or two of us may become a ghost. We may not. We may go. We may go to where all good ghosts go. And, and please, let me try and get away from them. I'd like to change the name from ghost to energy. Because it is an energy source that's inside you that leaves the body on point of death and goes somewhere. Please don't ask me where. Because <laughs> I can't tell you. And I don't think it's heaven and I don't think it's hell, but I think it's another another dimension or spiritual plane or frequency or something, but they're around us, they're not up there and down there. I mean, right, okay, wait, wait. Grandad, or whatever, isn't up there, or, or, or down there for that matter. Yeah, you know, when did you last fly at 30,000 feet? You've just come back from... Yeah. <laughs> Were you about 30,000 feet off? Yeah. Did, you, did you look out the window, did you ever sit, did you see an angel sitting on a cloud? 
A wet cloud strumming a, a harp or... Have you ever seen one? Have you ever seen one? Gina no. probably did. Well, I'll tell you. I'm coming from. Has anybody ever report... How high is heaven? Is what I'm trying to say to you. Know, what, where, when did you last go up the top of Mount Vesuvius or Etna and look down into the, the fiery pit, the bubbling molten lava and, and, and see some guy clocking off for the day from stoking the boiler in hell <laughs> and popping out for a day off. Never. Because they're not there. Because there's no such thing as heaven or hell or any of this scooby-doo, silly, scary nonsense that, that the church has created to keep us under control. Um, so they are somewhere. So what I'm trying to say to you is, your loved ones, whoever you've lost or whatever, they're not up, they're around you. All the time. <laughs> they're here. Uh, I don't know why they don't come through more. I don't know why they can't come through. Forget this nonsense about, well, they're not allowed to. What do you mean they're not allowed to? Who, who says they're not allowed to? Well, no, you're not, you, you can't, you, you'll know when you're dead. No. But they do come back, they can come back. Um, they can be around you when you need them when you need them if you're in trouble. Um, they can come back and see the grandkids if they never saw them. That sort of stuff, there's no doubt about it. They are around us, they're not up there or down there. Uh, they're on a different level, but they're here. And all of a sudden, for some reason, they suddenly break through, sometimes. And I'm not sure, there's, there's too much, you know, I'm not gonna live long enough to be able to answer all the questions. Uh, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm trying to create a rational explanation for this whole damn ghost business, rather than the Scooby-Doo scary thing that's going to get you at three in the morning, stood at the foot of the bed with chains hanging from its wrist, going, <laughs> <laughs> crap, on it. Because that's not what it's about. They're not there to get you. That's the first thing. Ghosts are not there to get you. And I had a very interesting conversation, really interesting, with the guy uh, Thursday night in, on the Isle of Wight. He was Colombian, and he brought his 10-year-old granddaughter on a ghost hunt, which I thought was a bit strange. And he's really into the scientific side of things, really big time into science. And, oh, I love what you're saying about because I haven't done the, the scientific stuff tonight about that 60% of ghosts are nothing more than a recording held in the fabric of the building and all that sort of stuff, which some of you have heard. Um, and he was full of, of this, I believe, I really believe what you're saying about this scientific stuff and, and I want to know more. I, wow, that's absolutely amazing. And then when I did, me, did the, the talk, and I did the whole talk about um, demons, and there's no such thing as demons, there's no such thing as the devil. The church has made all of this stuff up to frighten us. There was, there was evil, wrong. There was good, so the church had to create evil. Um, simple as that. There had to be, you know, good and bad, um, okay, which there is, I have to admit. Um, and there's no such thing as the devil. That was made up by the church. It was uh, a Phoenician day. They said, look, we've got to find something really evil to terrify people into towing the line. Uh, and so, well, there's a very good, there's a, there's a deity, which was like a god, called Beelzebub that was a Phoenician deity. Oh, he's good, oh, he's a good one. He's quite scary. But you know, he's not really scary enough. So I think we need to give him horns, and red skin, and cloven hooves, and a pitchfork, and, and they made, they created the devil out of this guy called Beelzebub. And then, well, we've got a devil, we've got this big devil. We need little devils. So we need to create demons. Demon. And demons. demons are little demons that, that, that go around whispering people's ears. So anybody that was frightening, if you were a medium, mediumistic, or you, you were hearing voices from, the, from, from your loved ones or something like that, oh no, you know, it was a demon whispering in your ear. That's and all this funny. absolute nonsense. Anyway, so I'm doing all that. Anyway, this guy suddenly comes along after the talk and he says, I agree with what you're saying about the science, but he says, you are wrong about, because there, there are demons. I said, really? Oh yes, there are things in, uh, in India called jinn, 
which are like genies. And I said, right, okay, yeah, okay, I'll get that. And there is evil. I said, I know there's evil. Don't get me wrong, mate. I know for a fact Hitler ain't wandering around picking daffodils at this time of year, because he isn't, because he was an evil person. Um, but, uh, you know, as regards, oh, no, there are, oh, there are demons. I said, oh, yes, and he said, it goes back 4,000 years to so-and-so, so-and-so. And there were two brothers, and one was evil, and one was good. And, they be, and I'm thinking, I cannot believe this bloke. He believes all this... Spanish stuff that, that which is Catholic yeah. again and I'm thinking you're you're a scientist and you're saying you believe in all this stuff I'm telling you and yet he comes up with this mumbo jumbo that he also believes and I'm thinking this is not right because with guys we're still in the middle ages as regards ghosts we still don't understand what they really are and they're all down to energy and they're not, when well, I say they're not evil, they're not, they shouldn't be scary. Don't fear what you don't understand, is one of my yes. big phrases at the moment. But we do, of course we do. You know if, you know if a UFO landed outside there now? <laughs> oh my God, what would we do? What would, we do? What would you do? <laughs> <laughs> Take a <laughs> oh, 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 Everybody nowadays. <laughs> What about that poor bugger that a few last year was it that was bloke was attacking him in the in the <coughs> in the underground with a knife oh, and he was and the blood, everyone was like and, all, and at the end of it they got him and they managed to save him and this was don't worry mate I've got it all on film <laughs> why didn't you throw your phone at him oh no too busy filming it you brat yeah, but honestly that that's what people are like yeah got it on film mate God Almighty! But uh, what? So what would you do now if the UFO landed outside in my garden? <coughs> <coughs> yes, sir. What would you do? No. What? I'd do the take, take a picture. Your leader. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd take a oh. picture and run that way. I'll tell you what we'd do. Night. We'd all find somewhere to hide. Somebody would ring the police. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> the police would come. Bring the army. And they'd come and they'd nuke it. <laughs> they would. Yeah, they would. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Why? Because we've all seen War of the Worlds and H.G. Wells and Russell. all of all of all of the scary stuff on Hollywood and Quatermass and the Pit and whatever. All of, yeah, we 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 would. It's not, why, it. it's not why we would destroy it. We would destroy it because there would be something more powerful than us, and uh, our glorious murderers and. Warmongers would not allow anything more powerful than us. Well, that's a point. The <laughs> but supposing, <laughs> supposing they came in peace, supposing they came to help, so like, government it wouldn't matter. <laughs> wouldn't matter. No, you're right. It wouldn't matter. We'd, we'd, we'd destroy it. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, we would destroy it. Destroy something we're afraid of. Don't fear what you don't understand. Yeah. yeah. People in power want to retain power. That's why they invented this little thing called religion. Yeah, you're right. Religion. By definition, yeah, it's purely and simply a tool used by those that cover power Correct. to control the masses through fear, and that is the definition of religion. I love it. And if you were in certain countries, you'd be arrested just for saying it. Yeah, you would. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. There's no doubt about that. See, it all started with Christianity, and that's what's caused ghosts. You see, there weren't many, there were ghosts, but not many, before um, Christianity excuse me, came on the scene. Oh, the Roman Emperor uh, Constantine, who funnily enough was in York, big statue of him outside the York Minster. Yeah. And I saw it, I said, when I do a ghost, when I do the ghost, I said, you're responsible for all of this. You are sat there on your throne with your sword in your hand. Um, because basically he was a pagan, but his mum was St. Helen, keeper of the cross, a good Christian. And he realised that Mum's religion was something special. Was going, it was going somewhere. So he hijacked it, nicked it, and called it the Roman Church, which is where it all started. And he thought, this is a very good way of controlling the population through fear. And so they invented all the terrors that have kept us under control for nearly, to, well, not quite, We've lost it now, but some people still. Ten Commandments, Seven Deadly Sins, Four Mortal Sins, Judgment Day, 
purgatory, hellfire, damnation, beals of a bomb, and that works a lot. You don't see this. <laughs> minded people, which they were in those days, believed it. All of it. And, and some of them still do. That's the trouble. You know, I mean, you, people in, in Catholic countries still believe all of the mumbo-jumbo that the church has been preaching, and that's why they give so much money to it. Because, oh, I mean, there, there's so much that, I mean, um, Cluniac monks uh, from, from Cluny in France, they they were responsible for creating it. They used to they used to pray for people's souls to have a quick exit through purgatory, and you would have to pay Cluniac monks to to actually pray for you, and you'd give them lots and lots of money. You'd get I'm trying to think what the word you'd pay them a, a oh dear it was a bit like buying a book token from W H Smiths or or from Waterstones, and the more indulgences. You, that's right. you bought indulgences from the Catholic Church and you'd pay an awful lot of money for an indulgence and the more indulgences you bought the quicker you could get through purgatory to get straight to heaven and so they'd have chantry priests would then pray for your soul to go, and, and you believe this nonsense absolutely believed it Henry VIII who was, had taken the Catholic Church away paid chantry priests at his deathbed to pray for his quick exit through purgatory and yet he'd done away with the Catholic Church but he still thought I better just have a go just, just in, in case. case just in case it's absolutely unbelievable but as I say <coughs> going back to the script a bit these poor people sat in these cells here waiting for death knowing what was going to happen to them um, I cannot imagine um, what's still recorded in, the, in these walls and, and I will just very quickly, if, if I may, take another five minutes to just say that the other part of the ghost business, 40% of ghosts is what I'm talking about, spirit and soul of a dead person and intelligence. The other 60% is a recording held in the fabric of the building. I'm going to do one or two demonstrations in a bit, show you um, the fact, and show you something quite intriguing. Um, sandstone limestone, granite, clay, bricks, glass, porcelain, um, quartz, crystal, bone, uh, all contain silica. And silica makes up the whole of the Earth's crust, all of it. Half the Earth's crust is made up of oxygen, which is negative. The other half of the Earth's crust is made up of silicon, which is positive. And when the two come together, they create SiO2, silica, silicon dioxide, um, which is halfway towards this recording business, halfway. Right, question, and I've asked it so many times, and most of you know, what, what are your microchips made of in your computer? What sort of chips are they? Silicon. Silicon chips. What do they hold? Mm -hmm. oh. Data. Memory. Data. Data. Memory. Information. I'm halfway there to a wall being able to hold right. The redder the sandstone in the building, and just look at, just look at that chunk of sandstone under that window there. The redder the sandstone, the redder the bricks, the redder the clay, the more iron oxide there is in it, which is rust, which is magnetic. I am there. That has uh, sil silica is a semiconductor. I forgot that. Bit. Um, who'd have thought a hundred years ago I could take a bit of, bit of sticky silica tape and sprinkle the iron oxide particles onto it, which is rust, which is magnetic, and I could record onto it. It's a cassette. It's a mini DV uh, tape. It holds a recording. So does a brick wall. So does a red sandstone. I can't even say it. A red sandstone wall. It holds a recording in the same way as, as, as a cassette does. Um, it's the image of a dead person. It's not a ghost. It's 
not a spirit, it's not a soul, it's nothing more than a recording. I'm a recording in there now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but, and I won't be able to interact with you. Um, and you wouldn't be, fr well, you probably would be frightened of that, actually. But, I mean... <laughs> but, do you see where I'm coming from? So, and the question that most of you know the answer to, because I've asked it so you know, why aren't all ghosts stark naked? How can you see the ghost of my code? It's because that's how I was dressed when the recording was made. That's how I'm dressed. Yeah? With a coat, you know, because it's a recording. And that's why, you know, how, the Roman soldiers in York, best ghost story in the world, mm. sort of Tre mm. treasurer's house in York, yeah. uh, those Roman soldiers have got helmets and swords and shields and sandals and, well, how could you see the ghost of there? Because they were nothing more than a recording. They didn't interact with Harry Martindale, the guy that saw them. They didn't nod to him as they went by, because they were a recording. John Wayne doesn't nod to you when you're watching a cowboy film, does it? And say, hello, Mrs. So-and-so, are oh, you enjoying the film? Uh, Stick the kettle on, love, I'll be out, pop out the screen and have a chat with you. No, he's a recording. And luckily, luckily he was dressed as he was when the film was made. And um, I don't know, some of you may have heard this, some of you may not. Um, this is a bit of proof, again, about what I'm saying. Um, I did a DVD, which isn't on sale here, because I haven't got one here at the moment, Nottingham to Ghost, funnily enough. And some of you probably know, um, there was a very famous battle um, near, um, near Newark um, in 1487. And I can't remember the name of it. The Battle of um, something. What the hell was it? God, come on. Yeah, I'm very tired. By the way, I was, listen, guys, I must explain to you. I'm, I'm knackered. I, 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 I was up till three o'clock in the Isle of Wight <laughs> on Thursday night. And then I drove all the way back from the Isle of Wight yesterday. And I'm out again here tonight. Um, so I'm losing my marbles. Um, I can't remember the name of the battle, but regardless, it's East Stoke. Just comes back to you like that, doesn't it? The Battle of East Stoke near Newark. 1487. Uh, Henry the Seventh who had just won the Battle of Bosworth two years earlier, and this lad called Lambert Simnel, who reckoned he was one of the princes in the tower that hadn't been executed, which was a pack of, like, he was a pretender. And he brought 5,000 Irish soldiers over from Ireland to fight Henry VII's soldiers, right? Uh, and they were slaughtered by Henry the Seventh soldier with his archers. They were lying on the battlefield like porcupines, absolutely stuck pigs with arrows in them. So I went through the story of the ghosts and everything like that. And one of the stories was that um, there's this place called the Bloody Red Brook. Kind of say it, the Bloody Red Brook. And on the anniversary of the battle, the blood flowed into the water, and the water flows red every year. Wow, okay, that's an interesting one. And naked soldiers have been seen on the battlefield. Whoa! Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I did all this, right? And I thought, wow, well, interesting, laughed jokingly, right? In my researches since, I found that the whole of the battlefield at East Stoke is red marl, red clay silica and iron oxide which holds recordings when the back when the when the brook flows red it's purely and simply when it's been raining heavily the clay uh, the, the, the water turns red and runs into the brook and it turns red but the fascinating bit was that in 1487 irish soldiers irish mercenaries fought naked no wonder the English ran. <laughs> but guys, do you understand where I'm coming from? They were dressed naked, so they were recorded naked. And it's the only instance anywhere, and no, that's not true, that's one of the, that I've ever heard of naked soldiers on a battlefield. I found it highly amusing at the time. Until I, but it's just a little bit more proof of... That, that that's how the recording was made. There is nothing more than a recording. And I believe it hold, it makes up 60% of what we mistakenly refer to as a ghost. 
because it's the image of a dead person. So if I was to you know, drop a screen down now and say, right, we're going to do a cowboy film, we're not doing a ghost film tonight, you're going to watch John Wayne, um, I don't know, she wore a yellow ribbon or whatever it happens to be filmed, you know. Would you all run out this building saying, fetch the exorcist, we've just seen the ghost of John Wayne? Because it's a recording, isn't it? You know? Today's magic will be tomorrow's science. Mm. It's, it, it, you know, we're still in the Middle Ages as regards ghosts. Energy um, is what creates the whole damn thing. Um, I've done it so many, I've got my kit and I've got my kit. You know, when I go home tonight, um, I shall go down my drive and I shall press a button. Well, they won't actually because they're broken, but normally, <laughs> my, normally my gates open on their own. Well, what would someone have thought of that 100 years ago? Magic. But you've set it yourself there, exactly. You press the button because you've got something to project it. Mm. What I'm interested in is the recordings are in there. How do they project Thank you out? so much. Thank That's you. That's what I want to Thank know. you. Yeah. How do right. they right. project out and yeah. how do we see them? Right, I'll tell you how. I, I, I'll, I'll try and explain because that's, that's the whole crux of the matter, right? But there's two bits here. There's two things. Because, you see, I, I don't just like to... What's the word I'm looking for? Pull the wool over people's eyes. That's it, end of story. Because, number one, I want to know why you don't see the death taking place. Why do you see the Romans marching mm. rather than... Because I believe moments later they were slaughtered, hacked to pieces, and the energy from them during the course of the recording to be held in the building. That's the, number one. But the second thing is, who presses the replay button and how? Mm. Right. Um... About ten years ago now, there was an article in the, in the paper about the magnetic lady. And you, some of you may have seen, you may have seen it about some Mexican guy as well. Uh, this lady had spoons hanging off her chest. <laughs> Photograph of her with his spoons hanging from her. She's so magnetic, she's so energetic, that she emits more than the normal two kilowatts of electricity that most of us emit in a 24-hour cycle. She can't get a job in IT, because she blows up the computers. <laughs> when she walks into a room, she blows light bulbs. Because she's, she's an energy source more than... Cause all of us emit two kilowatts of electricity in a 24-hour period. But, and I'm going into that. We also have a power reservoir inside us that, that we can use in time of crisis, which is where the recording comes from, because it's called a death flash. Um, I'm going into all of it now, I might as well. Here we go. The body... Uh, contains a lot of silica uh, because we're 75 percent water and water contains a lot of silica uh, especially spring water because when it rains the water flows over the mountains and it absorbs the silica from the granite the clay the limestone uh, uh, and so the so spring water is uh, the best one over here is Evian um, and I might as well do this and finish this um, we contain more silica in our bodies than we do iron. Our hard drive, our memory source, our brain, is actually made up of 85% water. 85%. This computer up here is 85% water. Does that mean that the new, one day the new supercomputers will be water-based? Because this is. And this is receiver, recorder, transmitter, video player, satellite navigation system, still camera, best computer ever. Not, not this, but most people don't. Never, never goes to PC World and say, get more memory, does it? It just absorbs and keeps doing It's the best computer. We'll never create a computer like our own brain. And everything in a computer is based on what's up here, right? Punchline of the story is we contain more silica in our bodies than we do iron. Our hard drive is made up of 85% water, which contains silica. As we, as we grow older, we do not retain as much silica in our bodies as we did when we were young. You can't overdose on silica. You can take a lot and it passes through the body. But as we grow old, we don't retain the silica that we did when we were young. And what do we lose? Memory. Thank you. They've been experimenting in France for 23 years 
by adding extra silica into the water of elderly people and they've reduced the degenerative diseases including Alzheimer's by 17 percent silica memory recording right okay but I, I still haven't answered your question <laughs> yes. Right. I'm still waiting. Waiting. I know. <laughs> right. So, um, oh, come on. Keep going. East keep, 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 keep it going. East Stoke. <laughs> all of that. We don't know what. Yeah. Um, that's it. The, the magnetic lady. That was it. So she can't get a job with the IT because her energy blows things up. She, light bulbs. She blows off. The punchline of her story was. The more stressed I get, the more light bulbs I blow. So, I still can't believe I haven't done it yet. We might try and do it tonight. I want to interview people that have seen ghosts and find out what frame of mind they were in when they saw it. And secondly, can we induce the same frame of mind they were in when they saw a ghost and see if they'll see something again? So, I'm in Gloucester doing a signing for a DV. Go, go to Gloucestershire. Um, 999. 999. <laughs> Sign, <laughs> copy, play, whatever. <laughs> He's got it. <laughs> and um, there's this old guy with his missus. And he says, uh, I, I don't know really whether I'll, I believe all this or not. He says, But I have, I think I have seen a ghost once. And, okay, fine enough. and he said, uh, me and the missus had a blazing row, a really bad argument, and I stormed, I stormed off up to the bedroom. Now, it's normally the missus that goes up to the bedroom, isn't it? But he says, I stormed off up to the bedroom, and I flung the door open, I stormed in. And there was an old bloke standing in the bedroom um, with a, a Homburg, old-fashioned Homburg, Edwardian, and a, and a black three-quarter length coat and a, and a, it, it described it in great detail, he said, and a, and a winged collar with a tie. And he was there for about four seconds and I, oh, oh, what are you doing in it? And then he vanished in front of me. And I'm thinking, okay, you just had a blazing row with your missus. Your frequency's changed in your brain. Or you emitted more energy than normal. So. Is it when something happens to you like that, that you somehow, don't ask me how, press the replay button in the, in, the, in the fabric of the building and your receiver gets the image that's in the wall? That's what I'm wondering. That's the only thing I, at the moment, because you can't physically, but hang on, what's the difference between pressing the button and sending the whatever I sent out from my, my remote mm -hmm. to doing this with my brain. Because there's this thing called thought transference, which we are, every one of us is mentally capable of doing. Um, we are capable of, of sending something like, I think it's 20% of ghosts are of living people, not dead people. That you can actually, and, and, Crisis apparitions are um, very, very common with soldiers and their mums. So this lad's mm. dying. He's lying on the battlefield, severely wounded, and he's calling for his mum. And all of a sudden, mum wakes up in the middle of the night and sees Tommy stood at the foot of the bed in his uniform. And one of the best ones ever is... is um, was uh, Castle Leslie, in, in, which we did on Most Haunted. And um, Norman Leslie was a soldier killed in 1915 um, in the First World War. And before he was dead, his mum saw him. And the following morning, the gardener saw him standing by the lake. And uh, I did, we did this on Most Haunted. Quite a good story that was. And uh, he was still alive, and then about five days later the telegram came through. But when his mum saw his mum saw him, she said, Why, Norman, what are you doing here? And he smiled at her. And then vaporised. But he was still alive. He, he sent his thoughts 
to her while he was still alive. We are mentally capable of, of thought transference. We are not that far away from Star Wars and use the Force. We really don't understand what's going on up here. We don't realise what we're capable of. We're also mentally capable of moving things, which is where most multi poltergeist cases come from. It's, it's you moving things, children especially. Mm -hmm. I call it the Kevin and Perry, Ke Kevin and Perry syndrome, where kids... Because if we've got two kilowatts of electricity that we are capable of harnessing and doing quality <coughs> recording of us, we are also capable of using this two kilowatts in time of A, in crisis, but also when mum and dad won't let me go out to the party that night, and they went, I hate my parents, and all, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and you actually, children can make things move. But we, call it a ghost. It ain't. It's, it's our energy that causes things to move. Um, people do it, kids do it. I say, for the questions I ask when someone says poltergeist, I say, first question I ask is, is it a council house? Because <laughs> 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 the easiest way, now after, after Enfield and, and Pontefract and all that rubbish, uh, the easiest way of, of, of getting a transfer from one camp, if the council won't let you put in for transfer, then you invent a poltergeist. My God, that it gets in the newspaper and then the local... TV, take it on, before you know it, the council are duty bound to move you, and they do. And that happens, and the second question I always ask is, are there any prepubescent children in the house? Because it's the energy from children that cause things to move. It can even cause little fires in the bedrooms and stuff like that. We are, we are so much, do you know what, we're too busy taking photographs of Jupiter and, and Pluto, and, and a, rather than looking at who lives in here and what we're capable of. Because we only know who lives in one, one half. We ain't got a clue about the others. We, we just, too, you know, we need, to, right, here we go, I'm gonna finish at this, because it's, it's 10 to 10 now. Oh, my potatoes, oh, my potatoes are all right. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Not my potatoes. Um, right, some of you may remember the coal man used to come around, yeah, and he had a horse, and yeah, and he had, what did the horse have on it? Blinkers. Why? To stop what? him seeing what was from yeah, side. Yeah, to stop him seeing what was from side to side. Because he'd be frightened of it, wouldn't he? It would frighten him, yeah. Right, now, the Coleman's horse's blinkers have gone. We've still got ours on. All of us. The sooner we take our blinkers off and start looking around us and realising what we, that each individual person is, is the centre of their own universe and how, how much more capable we are of things mentally than we realise. We are mentally capable of curing ourselves of most diseases. We're, we're, we're amazing. We're superhuman. But we don't understand it. We don't realise because we've still got the bloody blinkers on. We're still looking in front of us, aren't we? And we need to take them off and start looking around us. But we don't. One day, perhaps we will. There's so much more to this business than, than any of us realise. Um, I will finish with, uh, do we have any scientists amongst us? Anybody with letters after the names? or Because you do realise science won't. That's my problem. Science won't have it. There's no such thing as this. It's all a load of nonsense. Mumbo, you know. And yet, and yet, hang on, guys. We, we, we believe that some guy up there sent his only son down here, right, and he lived for about 30-odd years, of, yeah, and then somebody they executed him, crucified him, and three days later he came back. <laughs> Woo, wow, hang on a minute. What's the difference? We're singing from the same hymn sheet. But we be oh, you believe in all of that. We have, we have amassed billions and billions and billions of money and finance in the name of, and we have killed, murdered, slaughtered, tortured billions of people in the name of because I believe my Santa Claus has got a red coat and yours has got a green one. And I, there's more chance of there being a Santa Claus, I think, anyway. Because <laughs> there is. As long as children will be alive, there'll be a Santa Claus, trust me. Um, but do, do you understand where I'm coming from? It's been, and yet, so science... God, how many scientists have 
might well be religious as well and believe in God and all of this stuff that slaughtered people. It, it's absolutely beyond that. So, next time a scientist tells you there's no such thing as ghosts, quote this to them. For the last 400 years, men with letters after their names, astronomers, have peered into the night sky, looking through their telescopes, looking at ghosts. Because by the time the image of that dead star travels the millions of light years to the end of his telescope, he's looking at something that no longer exists. He is looking at the ghost of something that once lived. <laughs>